Uh, good morning. My name is Susanne Geisler, and I have the first presentation of this webinar on renewable energy systems for buildings and PC compliance. And my presentation looks at how to achieve compliant input data for EPC calculation and an EPC which can be trusted. So this presentation deals with handling renewable energy systems in the EPC, in the Energy Performance Certificate, according to EPPD 2010-31 EU. This is the Energy Performance of Buildings Directive. The focus of this presentation is on compliance aspects regarding input data for the calculation of energy <coughs> building performance, uh, which results in the Energy Performance Certificate EPC. Why do we look at these aspects? The EPC serves as a proof that energy minimum requirements are met. EPPD Article 18 requires the implementation of an independent control system, and EPPD Article 27 requires penalties in case of non-compliance. And uh, in view of the challenge to achieve nearly zero energy buildings, or even zero energy buildings, uh, building services systems, increasingly rely on renewable energy sources. Uh, this is why um, renewable energy systems are gaining importance uh, with regard to uh, actually achieving uh, ambitious energy reduction targets. So in fact, uh, we could summarize um, all these aspects under the title, make sure that people do what they declare. So um, I would like uh, to start uh, with an example after this uh, short introduction. Um, an example about a problematic situation which highlights the need for a robust compliance framework. Uh, imagine an investor with a very energy efficient building and the energy performance certificate, the EPC, shows that this objective is met. But then uh, compliance checks highlight that there are errors regarding input data, meaning that the energy performance calculation result is worse than stated in the APC, but still meets the legal requirement in terms of energy minimum requirement. Uh, but there is no sanction as the legal requirement is met, but the investor does not get uh, the building uh, expected. So uh, that's, um, let's say, an, an example to, to show uh, why um, control and enforcement uh, is so important. Uh, because uh, faulty EPCs uh, will affect trust in the EPC. Uh, so there will be problems regarding market acceptance. And in fact, um, yeah, uh, what we actually want to achieve are uh, ambitious energy and CO2 emission reduction targets, 2030, but even 2050. Uh, you know, there, there is the, the ambitious target of uh, decarbonization um, of the economy by 2050. Um, so, um, yeah, uh, compliance frameworks um, are needed. They need improvement uh, to actually achieve um, uh, trust in the EPC market acceptance. Uh, and uh, support in achieving ambitious targets. So uh, the Energy Performance Certificate, the EPC, will be only as good as the input data used for calculating energy performance minimum requirements and also uh, renewable energy uh, minimum requirements. And uh, this is why uh, the QualiCheck project focus on the quality of input data. In terms of quality of input data, the key questions are, are there clear rules how to determine the input data? Are the input data determined according to the rules? Are compliance checks carried out? And are there sanctions in case of uh, non-compliance detected? So in fact, this is um, what we call uh, a, a compliance framework. And uh, just to refer you uh, also to our source book, um, 
which I will present also later on in uh, this presentation, um, where we describe um, how to improve and um, also design effective compliance frameworks. So I already addressed uh, that it is important to have sanctions in case of non-compliance. So what type um, of non-compliances have we identified? So what do we mean when we talk about non-compliance? Uh, there are three types of non-compliance, namely no reporting, wrong reporting, and not meeting the energy performance requirements. So no reporting means that um, <clears throat> the reporting requirements of the procedures are not met. A wrong reporting means that there are substantial differences between the data reported and the correct data, correct regarding whether they have been determined according to the agreed procedures or specifications of the works, and not meeting the energy performance requirements. That means that uh, the required energy performance or specifications of the works are not achieved. For instance, if the minimum um, building energy performance level is not met, or if a component does not meet the minimum performance requirements. Yeah. So uh, when we deal with the quality of input data, uh, we mainly uh, deal with um, this category of wrong reporting, maybe uh, namely if there are substantial differences between the data reported and the correct data determined according to the agreed procedures. <clears throat> when we talk about quality of input data, it helps uh, to classify them. And in QualiCheck, we have identified three types of input data. Um, we can differentiate input data um, regarding um, the, the, the building, whether they describe the building envelope or uh, describe the building services systems. We can differentiate whether data are independent of the specific building uh, considered or whether we have data that depend on the specific building and its construction. And uh, the third way of classifying data is following the way they are made available. Uh, whether these data are made available by the manufacturer through a database, whether they are recorded by an expert, measured on site, or uh, fixed by legislation. Um, the third way of classifying input data is most important for us uh, because uh, it provides information about the source of data and whether data are easily accessible. Um, in fact, we need data which are compliant, that means which have been determined according to the rules, and we need data which are easily accessible. So it's about compliant data and easily accessible data. And of course, um, in this regard is um, uh, product databases are very important. And this is also what I will um, uh, still uh, describe a little bit later in my presentation. Um, we will have, or we already have uh, published um, several fact sheets uh, on uh, various approaches. So please check also the fact sheets uh, section of the Quality Check website for more information on, um, on uh, how to make data available and um, compliance uh, frameworks in this regard. <clears throat> so um, what are typical data uh, describing energy services systems? Uh, renewable, including uh, renewable energy technologies. Um, for instance, uh, in the area of heating, cooling, ventilation, domestic hot water production. Um, typically, we uh, have input data on types of energy sources used, energy efficiencies, power capacity, energy input, energy output, flow rates, operating temperatures, and types of control. This slide uh, shows an example 
Uh, it is uh, an example from Austria how uh, solar thermal systems are dealt with in energy performance uh, calculation. And what you see here is a simplified comparison of compliant input data options for solar thermal systems in two approved Austrian EPC calculation programs. So um, uh, we have uh, the software one uh, in red and the software two in blue. And um, on this side here, you see what type of information is uh, requested by the Austrian uh, calculation method. It is the collector efficiency, the aperture surface, pipe length, pipe outer diameter, pipe insulation thickness, azimuth and angle of tilt. And on this side, you see um, uh, the type of input data which um, can be entered. So uh, you see that we can um, use specific input data. Um, we can also use default values, which means the program suggests um, preset values, which can be substituted by specific input data. Then we also have the choice of given default values. So it's like several preset values you can choose from. And then uh, we also have this case of fixed default values where the program um, pre has a preset uh, figure which cannot be changed. And, uh, um, and uh, all these options are compliant. So um, the range of interpretation is quite large in this case. So the software developers um, choose for one option and uh, they are all correct. And when you look at, for instance, um, um, here the azimuth and angle of tilt. So you have in the, the, the red software, it's you, you must enter specific in, input data in the blue software. Um, the, the program offers you a default value and you it's optional for you to substitute it by a specific uh, value. So um, it is quite evident that um, in this case, setting up an effective, uh, setting up effective compliance checks uh, will require uh, quite uh, some effort. Um, but in this presentation, I will not go into more detail on this, but I would like to focus a little bit more on specific input data and uh, which sources we have for such uh, specific input data. And um, in this regard, uh, labeling schemes can provide valuable uh, information. They provide input data uh, for, or they can provide input data for energy performance calculation if the, the rules uh, allow for this option. For instance, this is the case uh, in Austria. Um, in fact, we can differentiate two types of labeling schemes, uh, mandatory schemes and voluntary schemes. Um, we have uh, a mandatory scheme based on the eco-design directive and labeling directive. Um, this is uh, a mandatory scheme. It's um, based on self-declaration by manufacturers and control is based on market surveillance. On the other hand, we have voluntary product uh, certification programs, uh, which are, for instance, developed by industry federations. They are voluntary. They are usually based on third-party certification. And um, uh, the, the sampling scheme is crucial for the actual uh, quality of data. Um, so both schemes produce um, data which can be very useful um, in compliance frameworks. Um, they differ regarding energy-related minimum requirements on the product level, and they also differ uh, regarding um, the quality uh, of data. When we look at the mandatory EU, uh, EU uh, energy label, um, you are for sure familiar with the scale. 
Uh, this is just the, the example for uh, the new uh, energy label for heat pumps and heating systems with solar components. I just show this as an example um, how uh, the label is based on the two directives. In fact, uh, we have the labeling requirements um, addressing the manufacturers as well as the dealers uh, to make sure that all of them um, use um, correct the, 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 the correct uh, design um, uh, throughout uh, the supply chain. And the eco-design requirements um, according to uh, eco-design directive uh, put um, minimum requirements regarding um, energy, for instance, uh, water heating efficiency, uh, but also regarding other um, environmentally uh, environmental criteria like, for instance, the sound level or nitrogen uh, oxide emissions. Um, yeah. So um, this is the, the mandatory EU energy label um, based on the Eco Design Directive and Labeling Directive. And now um, I would like to present two examples of voluntary uh, schemes. Uh, both schemes have been uh, developed by the uh, respective um, industry uh, federation. I start with the voluntary scheme uh, solar key mark. It is a voluntary third party certification mark for solar thermal products um, and demonstrates to end users that the product conforms to the relevant European standards and fulfills additional requirements. It was developed by ESTIF, by the uh, European Solar Thermal Industry Federation and FEN, uh, also with support of the European Commission and in cooperation with the leading uh, European test labs. Um, it is a European scheme. Um, this is important. Um, it should help uh, to uh, get to have solar thermal products recognized all over Europe. Um, so how does the voluntary scheme work? You find all the information on the website. I would just highlight uh, that there are empowered certification bodies. Um, there are recognized test labs who do uh, the, the measurements, the tests, and important for us, there is a list of certified products which is um, very easily accessible um, in a database where the test uh, results are, are published. So this is the example of uh, Eurovent. Uh, it's similar. Eurovent is Europe's industry association for indoor climate process cooling and food cold chain technologies. They also offer a third party certification uh, to uh, show that um, performance ratings of products comply with European and international standards. And they also make data available in a product uh, database. So um, this is an example of the Eurovent uh, product database. Uh, if you would like to have more information on these two schemes, uh, please um, go to the documentation of the renewables workshop from 17th of January. Uh, we had uh, two presentations on the schemes um, during the workshop. And the documentation is already available on the uh, Bodycheck website. So uh, to conclude, um, <clears throat> what is the role of labeling schemes in compliance frameworks? Um, it, they are very important because they can provide easily accessible and quality assured input data for energy performance calculation. Um, so they support building related compliance frameworks if the rules allow for specific input data. This is important because, of course, sometimes input data are fixed by, by uh, legislation. Um, then uh, this is, might not be an option, but if the rules allow, uh, it's, um, it is very good. Um, 
In fact, it's logical to assume that compliance uh, with building-related energy efficiency requirements will be assured by using products awarded a label for complying with specific requirements. But um, I would like to emphasize that also in this regard, um, compliance and enforcement or control and enforcement is extremely important, also on the product level. Uh, requirements and methods to provide the evidence for meeting them must be clearly specified, as well as the procedures of control and enforcement. And in this regard, um, third-party uh, certification um, of a in, in, in the course of voluntary schemes uh, is, um, of course, um, extremely important. And, uh, and um, in terms of uh, quality control, um, the sampling uh, procedures are very important because, in fact, um, uh, the, the actual data quality relies on how good the sampling, how good the sampling scheme is. So, this is um, uh, what I would, what I wanted to say about, um, um, let's say, uh, sources of. Um, input data which are easily accessible and also provide uh, good data quality. Uh, at the end, I would like to refer you to the source book uh, on EPC compliance. Uh, you will find food for thought how to improve and uh, compliance framework uh, also with regard uh, to input data. So this is it uh, from my side. Thank you very much for your attention. and. I will be happy to answer your questions.